Yeah, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, London. Hello, Devox. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Still, How are you? Still feeling it? No. Okay. Yeah. Everyone's tired. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, this talk is about yeah, the most important thing. It's about your brains. So, brain-computer interfaces demystified. Can your thoughts take over control? So, this is the question, and we hopefully can answer them today in our talk. So, Jonas, what are you doing there? <laughs> oh, my God. I was load. trying to oh, close that, that. That's not a good start. <laughs> okay, that's not a see. good start. There we go. All right. Okay, okay. Let's move on. Before <laughs> we start with the talk, after this uh, small interruption, uh, we want to introduce ourselves at first. So, please, Thomas. Yeah, so my name is Thomas Andres. I studied computer sciences, and after my studies, I joined TNG. Uh, we've been to the DevOps a few times with some of our prototypes, which we built at the innovation hacking within the innovation hacking team. And um, this team was founded together with Martin. Yeah, right. My name is uh, Martin Furch. I've studied computer sciences and applied sciences. I'm working for TNG for yeah, 17 years. And you may, might ask yourself, uh, TNG, what is it? It's an IT consulting company based in Germany. Um, I hand over to Jonas. Yeah, over to me. So my name is Jonas. I'm a senior consultant. It actually still says software consultant. That's because the slide is a, is a bit older. But no, I'm a senior consultant at TNG Technology Consulting and I work in the innovation hacking team. And I think we quick, quickly want to go over yeah, we have a little we story. This. Yeah, we have a little story. story how you came in contact with the innovation hacking team. Exactly. So it was once upon a time, yeah, little Jonas, he's a huge Star Wars fan. And he was uh, yeah, at a conference and uh, Typically, at some conferences, we show showcases of our innovation hacking. This looks like this. And Jonas was totally interested in those now robots, those yep. drones and stuff yep. like that, right? That's me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know me. Yeah. I like and drones and Star Wars. <laughs> in our innovation hacking team, we do some crazy stuff, like 2013. Controlling quadrocopters with bare hands based on the usage of 3D cameras, in this case, it's an Intel RealSense camera, but we also played around with Leap Motion and stuff like that. Later on, um, we gained some uh, experience uh, again with 3D cameras. Here is the Oculus Rift DK2, and we built the augmented Rift. Yeah, uh, it's a showcase which, with which you can see the, eye, uh, the world through the eyes of a Terminator, yeah, with emotion detection and stuff like that. Yeah, really amazing. Yeah, and so on and so on. Here you can see a gesture-controlled now robot. We used the Kinect camera here. Yeah, you name it. Let's have a look. So Jonas was really amazed, really amazed. And Thomas, what happened then? Yeah, uh, then we gave him something. So basically, we gave him some sugar, but not only in the form of candy, but also in the form of nice projects. So here's the schematic of how it looked like when he got the sugar. But um, basically, um, we wanted to tell him, you will be a, a Jedi one day. Yeah. And he wanted to become a Jedi. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the kind of great. lies that they catch yeah. you with. <laughs> but but, but uh, before we move on, um, what was the most frequently asked question yeah. in all of our talks? In all of our talks, also at DevOx, yes. It was, why? <laughs> why do we do this? And uh, we are building showcases, showcases that we will never sell to a client. We are yeah. totally honest about that. But uh, we are doing it anyways, and this is, has three reasons. The first one is because we want to gain new skills. So we have 10% of our working time, which we spend on gaining skills by learning, but learning by doing is the best way to do it. And uh, by doing it in an innovative fashion, th this makes a lot of sense. Then we also want to inspire people. This is why we are here today. So we want to inspire you. And uh, you should also try out these, all these amazing technologies that are out mm. there. Yeah, and sometimes we try this technology so that you don't have to. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Of and, of course, because we can, because it's possible, because we live in a world where this is really happening and this is possible. And that's yeah. why we want to explore it. Let's have a look how we uh, do the ideation phase. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing is what we want to reach is uh, we want to have a technical challenge. We want to do to realize something which doesn't exist nowadays. Yeah. So uh, bleeding edge. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. 
it should be a new tech creation uh, yeah, based on the usage of bleeding edge technology, as I already said. So how do we do the ideation phase? So this is a typical meeting yeah, to identify hype trends and what you can see in the background. You probably recognize it, right? It's the Gartner hype cycle. So we typically have a look on that. And this is an older one, so this is not the newest uh, talk today. And here you can see the hype cycle for emergent technologies. Let's have a nearer look here. Thomas? Yeah, this was the one we used for the creation of actually right. this showcase. For this idea. And typically we have a look to the Gartner hype cycle and then we have a look what's interesting for us. Yeah? So, and back in the days we identified hey, brain-computer interfaces, that's, that sounds interesting. Deep neural networks, awesome, and some yeah, IoT, yeah? This, these are the buzzwords we wanted uh, yeah, to create an innovation showcase around it. And actually, we thought, how can we connect that? Yeah, and uh, that was it, it, that exact point that I found myself in that meeting two years after receiving sugar from Thomas. And um, well, something had not changed. I was still a huge Star Wars nerd, as I am. And so it kind of had occurred to me that me and the, uh, the Force, we would not be friends, but maybe there would still uh, be a way to control something simply with my mind. So we quickly came up with the idea. In the past, we've controlled drones with our bare hands, like not using a controller, but just with gesture control. What if we just leave out the hands and we just control a drone with our mind? So that was the basic idea, and we thought, well, this is kind of crazy. This combines BCIs, this combines neural networks and IoT devices for some reason, but can it be done? And that's when we started doing some research, and we found this very interesting video from the University of Florida from the year 2016, so two years prior. And in this video, well, what you can see is you have a bunch of students, they are wearing very funny things on their heads. And uh, what this video basically tells you, well, they're using brain-computer interfaces to steer drones. And as you can see, well, they're, they're showing quite a lot of stuff, also some drones flying sometimes, but that was just enough for us to see, well, this is kind of plausible. Maybe we can even pull this off and maybe we can even make it better. And that's exactly this process, how we built this pro uh, showcase, is what we want to talk to you about today. So let's have a first look at the agenda. Uh, first, we're going to dig a little bit into the brief history of brain-computer interfaces, like how all of this brainwave technology uh, came about and what brainwaves exactly are. Then we want to define to you, for us, what is a brain-computer interface before looking into the two big steps that you need to pull it off, before looking at a bunch of fields of applications and going to a conclusion. Yeah. So, Martin, history. Let's move on. It's yeah. The first publication of a fictional brain-computer interface was back in the days in May 1919 in a magazine called The Electrical Experimenter. And uh, if you have a nearer look on that, you can see um, how people thought how it could look like. So you can, can see this guy with his headband, yeah, and um, he is connected to some kind of a record tape and this information gets uh, transferred to this woman here where she can translate that into, into some other kind of information. So this is how people thought it can look like. By the way, there is a QR code on some slides. You can uh, just uh, take a picture of them. They will directly lead to the yeah, magazine, to the paper, uh, papers we are talking about today. So, yeah, it was just five years later that Hans Berger discovered electroencephalography. And it was, yeah, it was at the Friedrich Schiller University of Jena, and uh, he was a th therapist. And he tried to measure um, electrical um, polarity changes on humans. And uh, so he did that on his son. And yeah, you might ask yourself, okay, what is electrical activity? What is it? So when we are solving tasks, there is a higher brain activity in our brain. There are action potentials between neurons. And uh, the more complex the task is, the higher is the activity. And this polarity reversal, you can 
measure that. And this is what Hans Berger actually did. So this is the very first recording here of a human EEG. And what we see here is on the bottom part, you see a sinus control wave uh, of 10 hertz. Then we have so-called alpha brain waves. They have 8 to 12 hertz. Then we have uh, another control sinus wave. This is the, uh, how is it called, electrocardiogram. And then here you can see so-called beta brain waves between 12 and 38 hertz. So we want to discuss today what are different brain waves, how can we measure them, and so on and so on. But maybe another important information. Hans Berger didn't publish that. Can you imagine why? He was very, very unsure, unsecure about what he just researched here. And it was Pierre Glor, PhD, who said back in the days in his papers, the publication in the 1920s of the first paper on the human electroencephalogram by Hans Berger was an event for which the scientific world was not prepared. It was Edgar Douglas Adrian who connected electrodes to the visual nerve of a frog. And in his laboratory, it was really, really dark. But he identified when he's moving around the lab and he is within the side of view of the, bro of the frog, um, a loudspeaker which was connected to this visual nerve just reacted. It gave some noise. And when he was away, there was just little noise. And this was where Edgar Douglas Adrian was able yeah, to prove, okay, there is something like brain activity, brain waves, and stuff like that. And this brings us to the Berger effect right now. We already talked about alpha and beta brain waves. What is it? We already learned different ranges of hertz. But if you have your eye opened, you automatically, you are automatically in the state of yeah, having measurable beta brain waves. If you close your eyes, you will not be able to measure those beta brain waves anymore because they are there. You will also be, uh, you will only be able to measure alpha brain waves now. And if you open the eye again, you will have the beta brain waves. Yeah. But there are, of course, very, very different types of brain waves. So here, delta, deepest mediation, healing sleep, you're almost dead. Then we have theta, you can see it, vivid imagery, thoughts beyond conscious awareness. Alpha, we had that, beta. And if you do very, very complex tasks, multitasking and stuff like that, then you are in the state of gamma brain waves. You actually can measure. So how can you measure that? With an EEG. This is how an actual EEG looks right. Uh, no, no, no. This was in 1934. This was the very first EEG based on a Western Union ink writing undulator. Yeah? Actually, you can see this in the museum. And this is how they did it back in the days. Yeah. But there is, of course, a cinematic approach in the pop culture, Thomas, right? Yeah, so whenever you have a look at um, something that controls the brain, something that manipulates the brain, something where you control something with your brain, there's always this head-mounted, this uh, this, this head-mounted thing, thing that you have. Device. <laughs> yeah, device. So let's call Machine. it. Let's call it device. Here we have a scene fr from Flash Gordon. You have this huge head on, and this is not. <laughs> an EEG, this is not reading your thoughts, but it's exterminating your thoughts in this, in this case. Um, but also, if you have a look at the uh, later movies, something like uh, Back to the Future from 1985, uh, there, Doc Brown, Emmett has also this uh, huge hat on. And so, so, so this is something uh, that goes through pop culture. You always have to have these head-mounted uh, devices that you, that you really want to wear. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So. But let's have a look at real EEGs now, uh, or real brain-computer interfaces now. And for, 
First of all, we'll have to have a theoretical introduction into the topic. There was yeah, a taxonomy which was uh, coined by uh, Jacques Vidal in the year 1973. And it, something goes like that. Uh, you have a human, then do you do some data acquisition. So data acquisition is actually the EEG part that we are doing. Then you uh, have to pre-process that. You have to f uh, extract some features out of it to and classify these features. So this is what we call control signal uh, generation. And these are the two parts that are most important or that are essential for each of the brain-computer interfaces that we're looking at. And then you can just pump that into an application and you're pretty fine. Yeah. And we thought, what can you do with all these um, brain-computer interfaces that are out there today? And we found a video from 2008. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, um, it is tested on animals, but um, it is pretty impressive when it comes to the technology because this ape is connected now to a brain-computer interface, actually, and he cannot move his arms. But he can, just given his thoughts, control the robot arm that you see in the picture, and with that he is then able to grab the banana. So it is possible to do something like controlling objects with your thoughts. And we thought, hey, what yeah. are the possibilities here? Yeah. So we are now in the part of the electroencephalography, so the EEG, and um, now we yeah, made some research. So which brain-computer interfaces are available, available and uh, how can we use them. So, at first we learned that there are three types of BCIs and uh, we want to go through them. So, here we found the Neuralink in 2016 and it is an invasive brain-computer interface. In other words, yeah, you, have, you, you need to have a, a surgery so that it gets directly implanted at the point yeah, where those special thoughts uh, yeah, are created somehow. Yeah? This is um, so an invasive BCI, but there is also a so-called partially invasive BCI. You still have to open the skull, but um, the electrodes are attached to the outside uh, yeah, of the brain. And uh, this brings us to the topic, when we do such innovation uh, things, there is um, always one rule, we just don't want to hurt each other. Yeah, you, <laughs> I don't want to get hurt, but you <laughs> wanted that uh, as well. Yeah, so, so uh, this is the <laughs> third group, those non-invasive BCIs, and uh, we had a nearer look on that. Yeah, exactly, because I didn't want my skull to be opened, and uh, even if we just put an electrode mat on my uh, gray matter, this, this, this won't work. So, so <laughs> we had a look at something where I sh ideally I would not even have uh, to, to uh, be bold. So, <laughs> all right, right? <laughs> sorry. All right, uh, wh which kinds of electrodes do we have available on the market. So there are all kinds of different electrodes that are there. So the first ones are something like uh, where you have a some kind of gel and uh, with that uh, this, makes the elect uh, uh, this makes the electricity flow e more easily through the electrode. Then we have these ball type electrodes here. Uh, but we also have things like brushes, uh, we have these spiky electrodes here, e everything to get as close to the skull or as close um, to the brain as you can pro possibly get. And um, there are different uh, types of EEGs that are available on the market. The first ones would be the upper pr uh, in the upper price range. So these are m kind of medical devices that you can get. So uh, the price tag is unfortunately pretty high. So this comes to tens or hundreds of thousands of euros, but on the other hand, you also get some quality f for that. So you have a lot of channels and um, the signal to noise ratio is mm -hmm. also pretty fine. Yeah. Channels but means... Channels basically uh, means uh, the different uh, ch um, information um, channels that you get from the different electrodes so that yeah. you can, um, uh, for each channel, you then have um, time series data that you can yeah. get. 
And then uh, there's the middle price range. Um, this is also not too cheap, actually. But uh, as you can already see, the number of channels go down. So does the quality, but these are also offering uh, quite some good uh, yeah. quality and signal-to-noise ratio yeah. still. But it was still way too expensive for us, so we went for the consumer electronics. There it gets interesting, because you can have these uh, dirt cheap ones, like uh, the NeuroSky MindWave, $100 in 2020, so <laughs> today it's probably a million or so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, as you can see, so, so these are really consumer electronics. And um, we'll have a closer look at the uh, Emotive Insight because it was the one we used in the, uh, that was used in the video from the University of Florida. And it, this is a five-channel EEG. And um, now we're going to have a closer look at where we want to place these electrodes. So we have a few electrodes. We can place them anywhere on the skull where we want. And um, we ha need a kind of a system where we could place them. And there's the EEG 1020 system, which was um, thought about uh, by um, H. Chesper in the year 1958. And you can see how this works if you have a look at, um, first of all, this axis here. So this goes from the tip of your nose to the back of your head and has uh, a few steps on its way. And from there, the electrodes are then uh, sprinkled out um, in a way so that they uh, go through the whole uh, head or the area that is of interest on the head. And as you can see here, uh, the blue areas somehow target the prefrontal cortex. So this is where high-level thinking is done. But we can also have a look at, for, uh, for example, the red areas. So this is the visual cortex where the information from the eyes is processed. And with that, we'll have a look where the, uh, the emotive insight places its electrodes. And as you can see, there are two in the front and uh, two near the ears, and there's one uh, near the visual cortex. So it's pretty much uh, sprinkled around the, the head a little bit. But yeah, you can never replace electrodes with, uh, except yeah. for... Yeah, you can always replace electrodes with even more electrodes, because five electrodes, ha, that's baby stuff. We want 16, and that's exactly where... The OpenBCI Ultra Cortex 4 comes in, and uh, well, as you can see, um, it's a beautiful headset. So OpenBCI, that's an open brain-computer interface initiative, and they make this Ultra Cortex 4. This is a 3D printed EEG helmet, and here on this image we can see, oop, that's not what I want. Uh, here we can see the, the version that has the Cyton Daisy board. Uh, that can read from up to 16 sensors at the same time and stream them to your laptop via Bluetooth. Well, not directly to your laptop, but via this beautiful Bluetooth dongle, which you absolutely shouldn't lose because that would be horrible, and that has definitely never happened to us. Um, so on this Ultra Cortex uh, 4, we have not wet electrodes. We have, well, more cost-efficient, cheap dry electrodes, and they are called dry electrodes because they don't need any kind of conductive liquid or gel. And this is quite handy because we don't have to like wet our hair with some saline or just put some gel in every single time we want to use this, and that makes it even better for uh, showcase purposes. And this means that now we have to have the uh, electrical contact directly via the electrode, and they come in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Here you can see the one from the original paper in 1994. You can see it has all kinds of shielding and, and built-in amplifier, and all that is basically done to reduce the noise that you get in your sensor readings. On the OpenBCI Ultra Cortex 4, however, this looks a little bit different. Here we just have these metal combs uh, that have absolutely no shielding or anything. They're just connected to the sensing board via wires. And that's pretty much it. And you might think to yourself, well, why are they shaped like combs? Well, what do combs do? They go through hair, and that's exactly what we have to do. And because they're so nice and pointy, they will dig deep into your scalp and give you some excellent contact, <laughs> uh, which is uh, not going to be painful at all. 
And that, of course, creating the contact is way easier if you don't even have hair in the first place, like Martin does. So let's have a look at how exactly that looks. Um, so you can see here, on first sight, it's, it's uh, easy to tell, well, the OpenPCI covers a large uh, area on the head, and you can also see it looks kind of hacky and flimsy, and that's because it is. But that's also a reason why we like it so much. And it also comes with these stylish highlights, like these clips that go onto your ears, and those are going to act like... Uh, yeah. Where's the other oh, one? That's, that's the one. All right. Yeah. Uh, and these are going to act as a ground wire, and that's important because the OpenPCI runs entirely on battery. Uh, so we still need that ground wire to connect uh, to, to close the electric circuit. And it runs on battery just to reduce noise. Yeah, so much about that. Now let's have a look at, back at the EEG 1020 model. You can see here we do actually get quite a great coverage of the entire uh, brain of all important brain areas. And if we were now to do some research on some specific areas, we could even pack the electrodes even denser. Uh, keep in mind, though, we can always just read only from 16 electrodes at a time. And so OpenPCI don't only make uh, very hacky headsets, they also make very beautiful software, like, for example, the OpenPCI GUI. And this is now a tool that allows you to read your brain waves in real time and display it beautifully. Here on the left, you can see, well, we can read our brain waves and just plot them in, in raw fashion. Then on the, uh, over here, you can see we can also do some frequency analysis on our brain waves, and we're going to see why exactly that is important for later. And then we also have this very cool head plot of, of which, to be honest, we have never really figured out what it does, but it just <laughs> looks really cool. <laughs> and then also, well, um, OpenPCI doesn't only make the OpenPCI GUI, but they also make the Webflow API. And that is an API that allows you to read brain, uh, brain waves in code, and they do that for C++, C Sharp, Java, and even Python. And that means that if everything works, fingers crossed, we can now even read brain waves live in this pr into this presentation. So please cross your fingers now. Yeah, That's fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, Okay, this is not looking good. <laughs> it worked just five minutes ago, I, I swear. Um, okay, let's try this again, but with a different USB port. You can see the OpenPCI, it, it doesn't only look hacky, it is hacky as well. Let's see if that makes any difference. Uh, should get a beautiful red light at some point. That doesn't seem to be the case. No. Okay, it's, it, let's try a different USB port. That's the thing about live demos, like they hardly ever work, like when it matters. Oh, well, let's see. Uh, I think... Uh, yeah, we're getting a red yep. light, and that means now we're reading data. That's the fun thing about Bluetooth dongles, like it depends on really what kind of Bluetooth uh, USB port you plug them in uh, when it comes to if you're actually getting data or not. So let's see, it's doing some blinky blinky stuff. <laughs> Which is good. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. We paid 2,000 bucks for this. <laughs> 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 you better work now. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> no? Oh, oh yeah. Oh. We, we were getting oh, data. Yeah. We're getting some kind of data. Not too fast, though, for some reason. Ah, I guess because it's... We, we, ah, okay, there we go. If I move over here, then the Bluetooth signal can go here. <laughs> and we can see this is a live brain waves from, from eight electrodes, and that's because we don't have that much space on this graph, and totally not simply because, like, three electrodes are completely broken. And um, <laughs> one thing that you can see, these don't really look like the brainwaves that we were seeing before. They don't look like that at all. They're going all kinds of different directions, and we can't really tell if we have waves on here at all. So, Thomas, what's, what's, what's going on here? They kind of yeah, look so messed up. So let, let's take another look at uh, the brainwave readings that we get. And uh, here you can see, so this is basically what it looks like, and you cannot really see anything in this mess. So uh, we need to have a closer look at the frequencies that are in there. So we did a, a Fourier transform for uh, the data that we got, and uh, it looks l something like that. So we have somehow um, all kinds of different frequencies in there, and you can see this huge spike here. So this is somehow weird because it is it exactly 50 hertz. So, what could it be? Hmm. 
Hmm. Yeah, it's basically just uh, the power from the power outlets that you get. And uh, we need really need to get uh, rid of that. So uh, we asked our good friend, Lucane, to get rid of it. In reality, Lucane is a filter that we, uh, that we used. And we did this a few times. So uh, we did some bandpass filtering, notch filtering, and uh, some additional data cleaning just to get from here to this one. And now we have some data with which we can really work. And we'll do this in another live demo. Yeah, I hope <laughs> of we course. have another two minutes or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see if it goes faster this time. Wow, this is really... Okay, now it just decided to stop working again. Okay, I guess we'll just return to this interesting piece of hardware later. Let's see. Another, another One last attempt. Try. Yeah, sure. But you saw it working previously. <laughs> oh, now we're getting some data. Uh, just you just need while. to stand closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just. All right. ah, awesome. Oh, yeah. And now you can see, now we have brainwaves <laughs> on eight channels. You can count. It's eight, trust me, <laughs> um, that look more like the ones that we saw previously. And one thing is, every single time I turn my head, you can see we get a beautiful little spike in here, and that is a reason why you shouldn't use non-invasive BCIs because they will be very uh, picky when it comes to like forces that kind of uh, cause the, the contact, the electrical contact to be harder or softer. Yeah, and with that, we could now do a live burger effect demo, but I don't think we have time for that, unfortunately. So, but now we can read our brainwaves. Isn't that great? Uh, fantastic. And you only have to like hold up a Bluetooth dongle in your head, uh, hand all the time. <coughs> and now we can move on to the next part in creating a brain-computer interface, which is the generation of control signals, Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Control signal generation. So the question was how to control a drone with brainwaves. Yeah. So we have the gleaned brainwaves right now. And the idea was we have to yeah, transform that into yeah, directions we can just send to the drone. And uh, our first experiment was, well, we are just sitting down with the BCI, and then I think about a fist. Then we just did a bunch of recordings of the brainwaves, and then we did the same for, yeah, I, I thought of an open hand, and we recorded again brainwaves, and so on and so on. We had a huge collection of gestures I was thinking about, and we wanted to yeah, uh, uh, use this, these special brain waves to yeah, control a drone, so to translate that into direction information. So, our arrow keys in this case. So, how can we interpret brain waves? So, if we have a look to this example we took out of a paper, this is a 15 seconds normal EEG. Hmm. So, how do I know if someone thought about an open hand or a fist or whatever? Hmm. Okay. Let's have a look to this one. Wow. From the computer science view, it's, it's, uh, it's really good because if you, if you have a look to this one and this one, they look so different. I can extract some information out of it, right? Yeah, but the problem is, this is an epileptic seizure, EEG. And, <laughs> yeah. That's this is not a, a way to control a drone. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good way to control a drone. So, what do we do right now? We from the innovation hacking team thought, well, there are thousands of papers about neurofeedback. We could read them. We could study them. No, nah, let's just do AI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we thought, hey, let's do this challenge uh, yeah, using AI. By the way, um, we are computer scientists. We are no neurofeedback guys, so be careful. <laughs> yeah. So we changed our idea a bit. So we thought about taking the cleaned EEG data and we wanted to throw that into a deep neural network. And the deep neural network will put out the direction we want to fly it with the quadrocopter. This was the main idea. So there was an idea we wanted to follow. It was about yeah, using a CNN for image classification. 
Yeah, actually, uh, we are quite good at uh, doing things with images. So, for example, having a picture of a cat and then using a convolutional neural network to decide if this is a cat, a tiger, or something else. But unfortunately, these two don't really go well together because we have some time series data here, and time series data is not an image, of course. So uh, we really need to find out how to translate that into an image. And actually, this idea is not that far off because uh, in the research we did, there are lots of people who are using so-called Gramian angular fields for the exactly this kind of application. So what we are doing here is we are taking time series data, then we are translating that into the polar coordinates and with uh, special algorithm. You can always scan the QR code if you want to know, go into a bit, little bit more details here. Then we can then uh, translate this into this beautiful image which we see on the right side. And this can now be the input for our um, image classification network. And with that we can then de determine whether it's going left or right or in whatever direction we want. And we did this, of course, for the 16 different channels that we got. So here we have uh, um, an analysis of the different uh, Gramian angular fields that we get over the time from the different channels. And with this, we thought, hey, now let's use some AI on that. Yeah, let's train a neural network. We have the neural networks. We have the data in forms of images. And look at this beautiful training graph. We have this blue bar that is just going up like that's our accuracy during training is going up and up and up we're getting better and better and better and life is good until we have a look at the orange line down here which is the validation accuracy that, so that's the accuracy on the data that we didn't train on but still collected and you can see it's somewhere in the realm of well 25 percent now let's think, think about like what what is our input what is our output well we have four directions that we can go into 25%, well, that is uh, kind of a double coin toss. So we're pretty random here, yeah? So we haven't really achieved anything. The neural network did what is called overfitting. It just learned how the data looks and not uh, didn't generalize at all. So back to the drawing board it is. At the same time, while we're at the drawing board, well, we figured thinking about a fist for uh, controlling a drone is not the most intuitive thing ever. And also, it was just very hard to collect this data in the first place. Like a little experiment for you in the audience. Uh, just try thinking about closing your fist like for 20 seconds without actually doing it. Uh, that's what we had to do for a couple of hours to collect this data set. And it's not the best way to control a drone because actually the best way to control a drone is by thinking of controlling a drone. So that's what we wanted to do in our second attempt. So the idea is simple. We just take one of these giant controllers and we control a drone with it and we record our brain waves while we are doing that. And the idea is simple. Well, we, con we train a neural network on uh, the control signals that we generated and the brain waves, and then at some point we can maybe leave out the controller and just use the neural network to predict the controller inputs. And we learned over time, well, it's kind of a bad idea to control drones in the office like at all, and certainly for collecting like hours of data. Uh, so we wrote a simulation, a simulation for flying a drone, which is actually more of like a snake-like game, and it's very beautiful. You can see here, uh, we are the blue guy, and we try to eat the orange guys, and we have to traverse through this beautiful gray world and uh, avoid the red guys. We, we call this game Eat and Don't Get Eaten, and we played this for a couple of hundred hours and collected our brain waves while we did this, so we had a data set that looks a little something like this. So on the one hand, we have the pre-processed EEG data, so with all the notch filtering and so on, and then on the other hand, we also have the stick inputs that we recorded. And we can now train a neural network with the EEG data as an input to uh, estimate the stick outputs. And that's what we want to do. And um, well, we did this for a couple of weeks. We tried to find the best possible neural network to do this. We trained our very best net neural network that we could find. And now we can finally play this game with brainwaves. Let's go to the food. Food. <laughs> well, you can see it's not like working at all. Um, it's just like randomly jiggling about. And let's have a look at the data, what exactly happened here. Um, so you can see, well, kind of, uh, we have good accuracy both in training and validation at like 90. 
But that's only until you realize that we're not having like discrete domains of left, right, up, down anymore, but we're like uh, producing directions. And this is not uh, like a percentual uh, accuracy, but more of like what is the error from what we predicted to the actual direction that we were supposed to go. And it's 90 degrees on average, which is again, just another coin toss and nothing seems to work. And we're starting to get very frustrated at this bloody thing <laughs> because apparently we can't get any data out of it that is useful for anything. So yeah, at this point we were kind of fed up with the open BCI. Um, and we decided to try something else, but this wasn't our only problem. Was yeah, it? there were many other problems. So <laughs> this, uh, these are the different types of headache, yeah, migraine, hypertension, stress, and wearing the open BCI for five minutes. Um, here we have some pictures how it looks like when I'm wearing the headset, so uh, those electrodes on my head, and after just five minutes, yeah, it really hurts and it doesn't make much fun. So anyway, so the open BCI maybe was not the best choice. So we had a look to the Emotive Epoch X, which is a very new BCI, which has 14 channels and has wet electrodes. It comes with a software uh, with which you can train yeah, something like those signals. And uh, we tried it a lot and uh, we were only able to identify between two states. So saying this, you could start a drone, you could stop a drone. But in the effect, you could say the only thing it was really able to measure in a really good quality was the burger effect. So being relaxed, closing the eyes and open the eyes. But this is actually not what we wanted. So also this experiment was not yeah, a good one. It was somehow a failed one as well. The next mind was our next device we just tried. Yeah, as we say in German, alle guten Dinger sind drei. So the third BCI here, this is the next mind BCI, which was the star of the show at CES 2020. And uh, it's supposed to go on the back of your head. And what they claim it does, it, it reads the projection that you, uh, that something that you see brings into your visual cortex. And they say they use some sort of AI, uh, but they don't really tell you what it is. And of course, the use case for this is gaming. So here you can see somebody playing a jump and run game with a controller mainly, but using their mind to interact with like some obstacles or monsters and kill those. And we had a closer look at how exactly that works because we were curious on how exactly this thing works under the hood. Quick warning, uh, if, if you do not like flashy images, maybe just look into your phone for a couple of minutes. <laughs> we don't want your EEG to look like this. So if we have a close look, uh, every single time we can interact with an object, well, there's this weird strobing uh, pill kind of pattern going on here, yeah? And if you have a look at how the Unity SDK looks like, you can find these things as the so-called stimulation textures. And the fun thing is these stimulation textures, well, they fit perfectly into what we just saw in the video. So we did a couple of experiments. We bought this thing, we downloaded the, uh, the API, and we uh, started playing around in Unity. We did an experiment where we created three identical cubes, exactly the same size, exactly the same uh, color, and we gave those so-called neurotags, which makes them strobe as well. As you can also see, maybe, while the strobing pattern is, every, uh, is the same every single time, the only difference between those cubes is uh, the frequency with which we get those flashes. So here we can make an educated guess, right? If you look at this for a couple of minutes, your eyes will start to hurt because it's pretty, uh, pretty tiring. And what this means is this kind of uh, is very hard on your visual cortex. And we assume every single time this thing flashes it, and we focus on it, we stare at it, this generates a huge impulse in our visual cortex that this thing can uh, read because it sits on the visual cortex. And given this, uh, given that the frequencies of the, the strobings are just different, this device can probably tell which object you're looking at. So how can we use this to control a drone? Well, we could build like some weird uh, kind of uh, controller like this where you have to stare at the direction that you want to fly in, which kind of goes against the entire point. We kind of want to look at the drone while we're flying it and not just look at the direction that we want it to go. So as cool and as innovative the next mind is, and you can buy it right now, it's pretty, pretty sick, it's not the solution that we're working, uh, looking for. So nothing really seems to work for us. How funny. So let's have a look at things that actually do work. Like what can you even use BCIs uh, for? You could use 
basically BCI is in all kinds of applications when it comes to the medical uh, field. This is pretty clear. Then uh, you could also just measure how comfortable you are with something. You could do, use it in marketing. So how comfortable you are you with some advertisement or something like that. Or for self-regulation, we already heard about the Berger effect. Then we have games and entertainment. This, this is what exactly what the next mind is targeting. And we have something like security and authentication. So um, yeah, saying hello to your PC using brainwaves. But actually, the only thing that's working right now, at least when it comes to consumer hardware, is basically this one. And this is the Muse. It is a um, yeah, self-meditation device, uh, which basically is also just um, educated burger effect. Yeah, so let's have a look to the conclusion right now. Yeah. So, so Jonas, what was your expectation? Yeah, we came in with huge expectations. I really wanted to become a Jedi, but unfortunately that kind of didn't work out. And even more so, it was really frustrating over time. It seems like whatever you do, if you don't drill holes into your skull, you, it's very hard to tell what's going on in there. Yeah. And this weren't the only issues. Well, for example, with the open BCIs, we had a lot of issues. Yeah, like, yeah, for yeah. example, well, it just hurts you and it has very unreliable signal. We saw that today. That was funny. Also, the hardware breaks all the time and it just simply hasn't, uh, doesn't have any kind of accuracy that you could use to yeah. learn some actual brain computer interface stuff with. Yeah. Yeah, and this brings us, uh, you could say, but wait, wait, there are BCI spellers existing since the 80s, but they somehow work. Yeah, like the next mind, for example. So you are just looking uh, to a matrix of uh, letters and numbers and stuff like that, and they are flashing uh, uh, there. And uh, if you see, actually, if the letter you are thinking of gets highlighted, then a P300 event will occur. And with this matrix, you are able <coughs> to d d uh, predict the letter or the number you are thinking of. The same... Yeah, it's true with the monkey video we just saw. Actually, what you can't see here, the electrodes go directly into the brain of the monkey. It's not just wearing a hat, a cap, or something like that. And if you have a look to this one, this guy is actually controlling um, his prosthetics um, via thoughts. But there is a huge difference. The thoughts to control the prosthetics comes directly already pre-processed from the brain and you just attach the prosthetics to your yeah, nerves which are coming out here from your leg. They are already processed. And this is not true for the stuff we are doing here where we try to record m memories, ideas or whatever. Yeah. And so let's come to back to the video that motivated us to do all of this in the first place this video right here. Um, so we went back to this. We thought, how can they do it? Uh, they're using also like the, the, the headsets that we're using. What is going on here? If you have a closer look, you don't really see that much of drone flying. You see them focusing very much on something, and the drone is barely moving, and they have to kind of adjust it. So what we're assuming here, it's mostly we're mostly observing something that is similar to the burger effect once again. Maybe <laughs> they were able to pull off that they could um, differentiate between three signals, like doing nothing, flying forward, and just landing again. But all of that just kind of gave us the confidence to say, hey, okay, let's just kick those brain-computer interfaces out of the Gartner hype circle. And that's actually what happened, Thomas, isn't it? Yeah. So if you have a look at uh, another Gartner hype cycle this year, not the year 2018, which we had this before. This is from July 2020. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, now we don't see any brain-computer interfaces anymore, right? Actually, we can see them. There are two-way brain-machine interfaces. Uh, and uh, the time until they arrive just moved also backwards. So five to ten years. So basically, it so was... In it other words, yeah. it evolved. Just backwards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so All right, so, so it's a bit... Our brains are a bit complicated and maybe not that easy that you can just um, control them or, yeah. or use yeah. them to control yeah. something with uh, 2,000 euro yeah. hardware. To sum it up, well, brain-computer interfaces, not really a thing, mm -hmm. unless you drill a hole into your head and really nobody wants yeah. to do that. Or, yeah. With that out of the way, uh, we have a bunch of other talks uh, that we held here at DevOx over the last years. Check out the QR codes if you want to see those. And that's everything that we have for you. And time is up. So 
Thank you so much for your attention. Hope you had a good one. See you next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.